Uh, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to pick up from where we left off last week, and I just want to do a, a short recap uh, before we get started, before I pick up from where we left off last week. I, we're still talking about hurt and offense, and one of the things that I was emphasizing, been emphasizing over the past few weeks is that hurt and offense are not the same, that while they are universal human experiences that both involve the emotions, they are not the same. Uh, offense is a universal human experience, but not every experience is, a, is interpreted as offensive. In other words, what offends one person may not offend another because we are all wired differently. We all bring different experiences uh, to our relationships. And we all respond in different ways. The difference between offense and hurt is that offense goes beyond being hurt. It involves holding on to a grudge or nursing bitterness and allowing the offense to change our heart, to contaminate our emotions and affect the dynamics of our personal and interpersonal relationships with others. I'll say that again. The difference between offense and hurt is that while both involve the emotions, what often happens with offense is that it goes beyond being hurt. As I've said before, we can be hurt and not people would not necessarily know it. But oftentimes when we are offended, it usually, not all the time, but because it affects it contaminates our emotions and uh, it changes, it can change our heart. It can also affect our behavior. Pastor. Not only our personal relationships, but our interpersonal relationships. Uh, Pastor Stacy, you have your hand yeah. up. Yes, I was trying to let you, I text you that your camera's a bit out of focus. Well, not a bit, it's a lot out of focus. Okay. I don't know what else to do. I've got it plugged in. Is that any better? Put your hand in front of it to see if it'll refocus itself. Okay. Okay. And take, you can move your hand. Yep, that help? Yes, ma'am. Come on, technician. Come on, tech. Come on, techie. We, we want to <laughs> see you. We don't want to miss none of this. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Um. So, so I was saying that offense goes beyond being hurt. Hurt happens to us. Hurt happens to us, but being offended is a choice that is often made by us. While offense happens to us as well, it also involves a choice. Hurt is, some, is the result of something that's done to us, but offense is something that we choose. We can choose, we can decide that we will not be offended. And of course, we know that it's next to impossible to go through life without being hurt or without being offended. But the difference between being hurt and being offended is that we can make a choice to be offended. We can make a choice to walk in offense. We've been looking at this, what I would call this memory verse in Proverbs that says, it is to one's glory to overlook an offense, that it is a sign of maturity if we can grow to the place where we can overlook or decide not to be offended. As I keep using this example of Joyce Meyer, uh, once I heard her teaching and she made the statement that has resonated with me for many years, she kept saying, I will not to be offended. Not, not that I will not, but I will not to be offended. In other words, it is an act of her will. She is making a conscious choice or statement or declaration that even though I could be offended, I will not to be offended. Uh, not that I will not be offended, but I will myself. I, I basically command myself um, not to be offended. Um, it's not the result of something that is done to us. It is something that we choose. And of course, in summary, offense 
involves a reaction, whereas uh, hurt is a response to feeling hurt or harmed or mistreated in some way. As we've been saying, it's possible to feel both of those ex emotions at the same time, that you can actually feel hurt and be offended at the same time. Because, as we've said, the brain recognizes pain, but it doesn't know how to distinguish it. And so all the brain knows is that you're in pain and it wants some kind of relief. So it's possible to be hurt and offended simultaneously. Because in many instances, the emotions overlap. Reverend Vahisha, do you can you put your hands on that feelings wheel, that emotions wheel you gave us once before, so that we can share that with the class? I was talking to um to you all about this last week about how important it is to be able to name the emotions that we are feeling. And I think having this emotion wheel at this juncture in the conversation would be helpful for us because all of it involves some kind of emotion and the emotions may overlap, but more often than not hurt and offense involve different kinds of emotion, but the, but the brain does not always know how to distinguish one from the other. But I, as I've been saying over the last few weeks, it's important for us to distinguish between being hurt and being offended because I think when we initially started talking about this, we were calling some things offense that were poss possibly more of an issue of us being hurt. So the question that we that I started last week that we didn't get to finish was, why are we offended? Not just offended. And you can go ahead on and put the slides up now, Deacon Sean. Why are we not just offended, but why are we easily offended? Uh, we've already established the fact that it's impossible. Jesus even said that, that it's impossible to go through life and not be offended. But Jesus also said that he, he um, said woe to the person that not only is offended, but also the person that um, instigates, if you will, or causes someone else to be offended. So our assignment um, as believers, as people of God who are trying to represent Jesus, who are trying to grow into maturity, into the, as Ephesians calls it, the measure and stature of Jesus Christ. Our challenge is to find a way to not only avoid being offended, but we ought to also want to avoid offending anyone else. So here are some key characteristics. Reverend Vahisha just typed in the chat that she put the, uh, I think the link in the chat for the for the feeling wheel, which would be very helpful in other instances, because so often in our communication, we are not good at expressing the emotions that certain behaviors or actions that are directed toward us generate. This feeling wheel will not only help us in terms of thinking about what what hurt feels like but also help us in terms of our interactions and the interactions in terms of our interpersonal relationships. So last week we started off talking about one of the things that causes us to be uh, easily offended is overreacting to minor issues. We went over that last week, so I won't go over that again, but I will invite um, someone to read Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. I don't I don't know that we got a chance to read it, but even if we didn't, it's good to read it again. Uh, repetition, as Billy Curtis says, is good for pedagogy. So if someone can find Ephesians 4, 31 through 32, as we talk about minor issues, how minor issues can bring out major responses. Minor issues can bring out major responses. And the scripture tells us that we should put aside certain behaviors, bitter words, uh, temper tantrums, revenge, profanity, 
and insults because when we overreact, we usually will end up throwing a fit, trying to hurt somebody else, say things that we really shouldn't mean. We end up acting out of character, crush other people's spirit when we don't know how to control our emotions. We're not saying that we should not react to issues. This is saying we sometimes can overreact to minor issues. And as I've been saying uh, over the past few weeks, one of the things that we want to do is, uh, as I said, if we're not going to go to counseling, we have to be our own counselor and begin to ask ourselves, why does that tick me off? Why did that make me wet? Why do I feel offended? And, and not only ask ourselves, but perhaps um, have some conversation partners or accountability partners that can help us be objective in terms of how we are responding to certain issues. Anybody have Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 yet? Anybody got it? If you have it, would you unmute yourself and read, read the passage? I have it. Okay, Tracy, thank you. Um, it's from the New King James Version. Okay. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another. Be kind. Come on. Somebody type be kind. Tenderhearted. Type that in the chat. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. My Lord. Somebody says struggle. It's, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Be kind. Paul says, get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every kind of malice. I'm reading from the NIV version. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And so one of the things that we know, I know this happens to me sometimes, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, that sometimes I think we can all admit that we have over we can over find ourselves overreacting to minor issues. Sometimes those the overreaction may be justified because as I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago, not only do we need to think about how we respond to other people or the way that we should respond to other people, but we must also think about the way we come at other people. Because sometimes our approach, the way we approach other people can push them to overreact, to push them to what may seem like they're overreacting. But we also, also don't know what people are going through. It could be that this was the straw, if you will, that broke the camel's back. They were already having a bad day. And then we come along at the wrong time. You've seen it when you're in grocery stores, you've seen it when you're shopping sometime and you encounter somebody and they almost bite your head off and you're like, okay, they must be having a bad day uh, because all you did was ask a question. But the way that they responded to you, um, said to you, was enough to put you on the defensive, if you will, unless you decided to defuse the situation. I know when I've been in situations where I've been the recipient of somebody who's acting like they are offended or it seems that they were offended rather than barking back. Sometimes I may try to diffuse the conversation by saying, you must be having a bad day or um, I understand. I understand what it's like working for the public, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the reasons, one of the things is overreacting to minor issues. Dwan Bailey, I see you have your hand up and then um, somebody had a Karen Owens, when you follow this passage and the receiver does not see that is what happened. So Dwan, if you would go ahead and then we'll come back to Karen. Are you, ra ra are you raising your hand, Dwan? Okay, Karen, we'll come back come back to Duan. Karen, you asked the question. Can you unmute yourself, Karen? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so can you uh, clarify what you're asking in this question? Yes, ma'am. Um, going through actually what you're delivering right now with with a friend of mine. Um, I've been always honest, not you know considering the situation, but no matter the statement, whether direct or indirect, it's always received as offensive, or the feelings are heard, or just genuine just, oh my God, why do you say that to me kind of thing? And so then I asked the question, did my statement offend you or was it a true statement? And a lot of times it's retor retorted with, well, attacks back at me when you're not really addressing the issue at hand. And so your question is, Okay, so the question is, how do you? Oh, were you just making an observation? I'm sorry. Okay, sorry, kind of both. Uh, really making an observation because again, I, I'm experiencing this very thing that you're speaking of. Mm -hmm. um, being in leadership, you know, you have to learn to kind of deal with people where they are. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, when you address a situation and then they become uh, aggravated or offensive then it's like, okay, did I say something that struck a nerve, mm -hmm. you know, or is this, you know, a true statement? You know, sometimes they don't want to accept sometimes the statements that you're making, even though they're helpful, are, harm, are, help, are hurting them because they don't want to admit their truth. Right. So as, is, this, is, an, is this in an employee-employer relationship or is this just um, in a friendship? Or do it's you just friends and you're having conversation? Yes, friendship conversation. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's quite possible then that it could be true and offensive at the same time. I mean, sometimes it's difficult to hear what other people have to say or how other people um, perceive us or or what they are seeing. And as I say to people oft often, Sometimes when we're giving people feedback, it's not personal. It is Correct. the behavior that we are addressing. That My question cool. I would also ask you is, when you are raising the issue, are you addressing the behavior or do you think that some of what you're saying is addressing the person? Um Learning throughout my life, sometimes it's best to just address the behavior because it could you can walk a fine line with attacking a person if you don't uh, be careful about just addressing the behavior. Right. And so you addressing the behavior, and they still they still get offended. That's correct. Okay. Well, I mean, like I said, it's quite possible um, that you can you can make a statement to a person. And the person does get offended. Remember, I said at the beginning that right. no, everybody doesn't interpret uh, offense the same way. What offends one person does not offend another person. And the other thing is people are at different stages and different sta stages, not only in terms of maturity, but also in terms of their ability to receive feedback. And so it's quite possible that they could be, they could be, they could be offended. They could be hurt too. I don't know. I think that perhaps you all might need to have some additional conversation about, okay. um, and then the other thing is if, if you, what you're finding is putting a strain on your relationship, I think you have to begin to ask yourself some questions. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? You know, does the, does the relate, does it, is it worth the relationship? understood yeah that's kind of where i am now asking myself is it worth it mm -hmm. because it does become strain on yourself you know after a while when you're delivering or trying to try different avenues and it's still it's like talking to the wall mm -hmm. yeah yeah sometimes yeah. people are not ready to receive and i think we have to be willing to accept that as well because it's really not not our job to fix people. Um, I think that accountability is important, but at the end of the day, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us and brings us to a place of change. 
And so sometimes you may just have to make some decisions about whether or not this uh, this person is ready for the kind of conversation that you had. And you might also want to try saying, can I ask you something? You know, I mean, maybe rather than just um, coming with your observation, you might want to ask, is it okay for me to share something with you? Sometimes people don't want you to share with them what, the, what they're thinking. Um, and, and, and of course, sometimes they just may not be ready to receive it. So there are other ways I think that you can deal with, that you can address a situation like that. And, and based on what I'm hearing you say, this person just may not be ready for the kind of conversation that you're having. Understood. I, I think I've arrived at that. I guess maybe was seeking maybe a little something else, but I think I'm right on target and saying, I think this is where I got to start questioning my ability here. Mm -hmm. Or okay. and maybe not necessarily your ability, but just that person's readiness. You okay. know, when, I, when I'm thinking about offense, I'm often thinking not just in terms of how other people respond, but also how I'm responding. Uh, one of the things that this lesson has made me begin to think about more deeply is my own reaction and the way I respond uh, in various situations. And it's, I'm always trying to interrogate myself, to ask myself, why does that offend me? Why did that make me mad? Why did that hurt my feelings? Uh, because I think that as we grow better, our relationships improve as well as well. And so what I would suggest is if this person is not necessarily open to um, the feedback that you're trying to give them and it and it, and it creates a barrier uh, in your relationship, then it may be time to just wait, you know, if, if you value the relationship. Thank you. Anybody want to uh, offer any uh, feedback? Was that Tracy that was asking that I question? I did. Oh, was it I Karen? Did. Oh, okay. I did. Who is that? That's Dwan. Dwan. Oh, okay. Dwan, what did you say? I, I want to share. I want to share the the point that you made. Oftentimes, we don't know uh, why a person is reluctant to deal with an an offense or a hurt. And they may be carrying that with them for a period of time. And then an incident happened in the relationship and you didn't know all of that was going on underneath the surface. But it is very difficult um, for us. I mean, we're not soothsayers. People have to want to, to address those issues. And sometimes when we love them, we give them the time and the space you know, to address the issues so that it doesn't ruin the relationship. And other times we just have to let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Dr. Harris said praying also helps. <laughs> yes, ma'am. To show you. And, and I also, at, one of the things that I also pray for is for, for the spirit to create the opportunity for the conversation. Um, you know, because timing too, I think is really important. Timing is is very important. Um, and and again, you know, we just have to, there are some things that we have to weigh and consider, as I said before, whether it's even worth the relationship. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move on to the next one where misinterpretation, and this goes back to Karen's question, I think. Sometimes misinterpretation, sometimes people may frequently misinterpret others' intentions, assuming malice or disrespect where none was intended. So actually, this could be part of it, too. While on, on the one hand, Karen, your intentions may be good, but they may not interpret it as such. And so as a result, they may uh, struggle with differing opinions or handling disagreements, becoming defensive, or even confrontational uh, when it comes to opposing viewpoints. There's some people that just don't receive feedback well. And then sometimes 
And, and we've seen this in our own relationships where when you're talking to folks, you say one thing and then they say, oh, so you saying that I'm so and so and so and so. Well, no, that's not what I was saying. Yeah, that's what you said because I heard what you said. But the, no, that's not what I meant. But that's what I heard you say. And the next thing you know, you got a kitchen sink because everything that that person, you or that person want to say comes out in that argument and you end up missing the point of the conversation. There is nothing wrong with disagreement. Everyone has different life experiences, which lead to unique perspectives, and it leads to different opinions and uh, beliefs. We will not always see eye to eye in certain things, but we must also consider giving grace to people's intentions, even if it's not a repetitive, especially if this is not a repetitive incident. Again, Karen, this goes back to what I'm, I was saying about if they're not ready, then it's probably best to stop bringing it up. Because if they're not, if if if, if this is something that you're doing on a re repetitive in a repetitive way, that you are bringing things to their attention over and over again, even if in your mind it may be as clear as the nose on your face. If they're misinterpreting your intention, is going to more than likely be met with offense. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So yep. misinterpretation of intentions sometimes also causes us to be easily offended because what we hear is not always what people say. <laughs> and what we say is not always what people hear. There are some instances where it has to be said, and that's why I asked if this was an employee-employer relationship, or if it was a situation where that person's behavior is problematic. For example, in a church setting, there are certain things that I, as the pastor, have to say. If it's, if it's affecting congregational health, if it's undermining uh, congregational advancement, even though it is not my intention to offend somebody, because the larger issue at hand is preserving the life and health of the congregation, those things have to be said. But in a case, I'm not ready for that yet, that slide yet, but in a case, if it is a situation where you are friends, it may be that you have to wait and just leave it in the hands of God. And, and of course, pray that the Holy Spirit will give you opportunity to have that discussion. The third one is difficulty in handling agreements, disagreements. Somebody go to 2 Timothy verse 23 through 24. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. <laughs> You what translation is that? I need that translation. That's the NIV. Okay. Read it okay. again. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments mm -hmm. because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. How many of us know people? they get offended when you disagree with them. <laughs> we all know folks that get, as my grandmother used to say, fist fighting mad simply because you disagree. I was in the beauty shop the other week and this guy came in. I hope nobody knows where I was. Um, a different beauty shop, not the one that I go to before you start trying to figure it out. But this guy came in and he was... Um, he was um, trying to sell some baked goods and things. And he came in, bless your bones. You know, he was all happy and everything and trying to sell his baked goods. And he made a statement about um, listening to Eve or something like that. And Eve, um, Eve gave the wrong, she, I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but I, I said to the girl that was shampooing my hair, I said, 
He, oh, he said, see, you're just like Eve, always trying to pass the blame on somebody. And I said to my hairstylist, I said, well, Eve wasn't the one that passed the blame first. Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed, <laughs> Eve blamed the serpent. And she told me, she said, somebody said, uh, <laughs> somebody said that Eve wasn't the first one to blame. When I tell you his whole countenance changed, when she made that statement, I really thought he was come, coming over there to slap her. That's just how quickly he went from grinning and cheesing about his baked goods that when she said, and I didn't, I didn't even bother because I told her, I said, don't even say it because I could tell by his demeanor that the statement would offend him. But you know, she likes to, <laughs> she likes to, to, um, uh, be petty for Christ sometimes. So she would, she loved the fact that I said it. She said, somebody said, um, Eve wasn't the, and when he, he turned around and he looked at her as if he wanted to, as they say, pimp slap her for what she said. And I told her, I said, just be quiet. I said, shut up. Don't say anything else. Cause first of all, I'm not going to get into an argument with this man about this. But it was just, I'm saying that to say that people can really get offended about something that they strongly disagree, even though we know, yeah, pimp slap, that's what they said, pimp slap. I, I, I would have to pimp slap this man, and I'm not getting ready to get into a fight here in this beauty shop. But the way he got angry by just that right, avoid foolish <laughs> quarrelings, stupid arguments. You got to know basically when to hold them and when to fold them, when to, when to push the envelope and when to let something go. And I could see in that moment that he was not even open to hearing anything about it. And he, oh, he told her, you need to go back, girl, you need to go back and read. So it was getting worse by the minute. I told her, I said, you need to stop. Because the fact that he calling you girl and you 40, uh, this is not going to end well. I said, so just be quiet. Don't say anything else. Girl, you need to go back and read your Bible. You know, so I was like, whoa, the fact that he, but what really got me was how angry he got. And she was, she said it in a playful manner, but I, I, I can't even, I, I just wish that, that you all could have seen how quickly he shifted when she said Eve wasn't the first one. I said, whoo. This is not good. So I said all that to make the point that difficulty in handling agreements can also lead to offense. We've grown up hearing people say we must learn to agree to disagree, but we know that's not always possible. And throughout the scriptures, even we're told not to engage in these foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing the reason why the scripture says it is that they generate strife. The scripture that we referenced was 2 Timothy 23 through 24. 2 Timothy 23 through 24. Because foolish arguments can generate strife. What I saw in that moment at the hairstylist was some strife getting ready to be generated over nothing. <laughs> and the other thing is, it was true. Eve wasn't the first person that blamed somebody. Because God spoke to Adam first. Since we're going to go, since I'm here, let me just go on and explain it. God spoke to Adam first. And Adam said, the woman you gave me, gave me the fruit. And then the woman said, not that she did not blame, but he jumped over that whole incident. And then the woman said, well, the, the serpent told me and I, and I, and we ate it. So at the end of the day, it was not just one person doing the blame game. It was both of them. It wasn't just Eve, but that thing was hot as fish grease when she said that. So difficulty in handling agreements in that moment could have led to strife. And what I saw in that moment was a whole different person show up. The person that came in grinning to me, how about some banana pudding? How about a little lemon cheese, a lemon chest pie? How about a little cheesecake? All of that vanished when she said what she said 
about Eve not being the first person to pass the blame. The truth of the matter is both of them were guilty. It wasn't just Eve. They were both guilty because if we want to take it a step further, the instructions were not given to Eve. They were given to Adam, but that's a whole nother Bible study for a whole nother day. Let me move on to the next one. The need for validation. The need for validation. Some people are easily offended because they seek constant validation and reassurance. To bolster constant validation and reassurance from other people to bolster their fragile self sense of self-esteem and self-worth. I'll say it again. Sometimes people are offended out of a need for validation. Because they seek, I said some people, not all people, because they seek constant validation and reassurance for to bolster their fragile self-esteem or sense of self-worth. Now, let me just say, all of us have a need for validation. All of us have an inherent need for affirmation, for emotional support, for encouragement, for affection, the feeling of feeling cared for, and attention. We need to feel self-consideration by others. And while seeking validation is a natural human inclination, an excessive and persistent need for validation or for external validation can be a potential source of conflict in relationships. Part of our alienation as human beings results in our craving and seeking unwarranted affirmation, inordinate attention. And this can be driven by unmet needs in the past, unhealed hurts, low self-esteem, in extreme cases, personality disorder. That's a whole nother issue. And can I just stop right here, put a pen right here and say, sometimes it ain't you at all. What we don't talk about a lot in the body of Christ is that some of what we're dealing with is personality disorder. I ain't even got time to unpack it tonight, but we do need to unpack it because some of these relationships that we are in, you will think you crazy and it's not you. And I'm not saying crazy in the literal sense, but I'm saying you will be you will be thinking that it's you when in fact you're dealing with a narcissist. You're dealing with someone who has a personality disorder. So we we haven't even talked about personality disorders, but personality disorders, um, unhealed hurts, un, unmet emotional needs, all of those have a way of affecting or creating <laughs> attention-seeking behavior to the point that it's never enough or to the point is uh, uh, to the point that external validation becomes essential for that person to function. And a need for validation, you would think that it would not necessarily result in somebody being offended. But if a person has an inordinate need for attention and external validation and unhealthy rely uh, unhealthy reliance, excuse me, I'm sorry, on, exter on external approval, it can have a counterproductive effect of driving folk away from us. So it's crucial to be able to strike a balance, to be able to accept constructive feedback without making it the sole determinant of our self-worth and fostering a healthy sense of self-esteem and interdependence. Because you will find that there are people who get offended because of a lack of external validation. Think about all the people that get offended on your job or in the body of Christ. Not because you have not affirmed them, but just because you didn't call their name. Can we talk about that for a minute? How often... Do we get offended in church, not because somebody hasn't affirmed you, but because they don't always affirm you?
but it's got to be somebody else's turn at some point. At some point, it's it can't all there it is. Come on, Holy Ghost. It can't always be your turn. Somebody type in the chat. It can't always be my turn. It can't always be my turn. At some point, I've got to feel know my own self-worth to the point that even if nobody ever calls my name, that if nobody ever tells me I've done a good job, if nobody ever congratulates me, and we're not saying that's the kind of world that we need to live in because we know that all of us have an inherent need for attention, for affirmation, and for affection. Can you type those three words in the chat? We all need attention, affirmation, and uh, 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 acceptance. Attention, affirmation, and acceptance. We all need those three things. However, a, an, a, an, a, an over-reliance upon that, when a person constantly needs attention, affirmation, and acceptance, it will result in validation. In 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 an I'm sorry, not in validation. It will re, it can result in feeling offended. Not because you don't have gifts. Not because you don't you are not um, uh, uh, worthy of self worth. You don't you don't have worth. But because of an inordinate need for validation. It can be challenging to be in relationship with folk that have an inordinate need for validation. Challenging. How many of you know it's challenging? It can be challenging because they have always got to be the center of attention. They have always got to be the one. You got to always be stroking them. You got to always be telling them how wonderful they are. You got to always be, I mean, it, <laughs> Lord have mercy. Let me slow down. At the end of the day, God's validation, God's unconditional love, God's unconditional acceptance, God's unwavering approval of us has to be the baseline for all of us. Because until that's enough, I will never be satisfied. And what happens in, in many instances, and this is why, you know, Joseph's brothers, for example, had issues. Let me just go to the Bible so nobody feel like I'm talking specifically to them. This, this is why sometimes we find ourselves getting angry when the other folks' name get called. Because why do you get offended when somebody else is being validated? Why do why does that offend you? You hear me say so often, clap like it's your daughter. Clap like it's your son. Clap like it's your sister. Clap like it's your mama. Clap like, because we'll sit up and won't even clap for folk. Won't celebrate other people. When we have this inordinate need for validation, we will find ourselves being offended. However, God's validation must be enough. Somebody type in the chat, it can't always be me. And I need to learn, not only do I need to learn that it can't always be me, I need to learn how to celebrate when it's not me. Because when it's not me, even though it's not me, it does not mean that I don't have value. This is the part that we don't get because we interpret it as if to say, if it's not me, then I must not be valuable. If it's not me, then I must not be special. If it's not me, then I must not be somebody. If it's not me, that means pastor don't love me. If it's not me, no, it can't always be me. And we got to learn how to celebrate when it's not me, when it's not us. Because God's internal validation has to be the baseline. God's internal validation becomes a source of strength and security. Type that in the chat. God's validation is my source of strength and security. God's, my, God's, God's validation is my source of strength and security, enabling, enabling us to withstand the not only the affirmations, the fleeting affirmations, but the criticisms of other people. Because let me tell you something. There are some people, I don't care what we do, they will never validate us. 
They will never compliment us. They will never tell us that we did a good job. They will never support us. They will never applaud us. They will never give us credit. They will never like your status on Facebook. They are like 10 other folk and won't like your status. They will never congratulate you. They will never say good job. They will never applaud you. So at some point, we all must, and, and this is not to say that sometimes our feelings don't get hurt because sometimes we just hurt. It's not that we have this inordinate need for validation, but you can tell when you're in the company of somebody that needs, needs constant validation because you can't, hardly, you can't hardly be in their presence because it's exhausting. It's, to be in the presence of someone that needs constant validation is exhausting. I wish somebody would just type, it's exhausting. I, if, you, if you know what I'm talking about, it's exhausting. It is exhausting to be in the company, in the presence of someone that always needs validation, that always has to be told how wonderful they are, that always has to be the one that's the expert, that always has to be the one that knows. It is exhausting. It is exhausting. <laughs> Y'all tickling me in the chat. It is exhausting. It, it, it will wear you down in the words of Phyllis Tuggle, down to a dime. It'll wear you down to a dime. So at the end of the day, so that we don't get offended, our baseline, our internal sense of security must come from God's validation. That's why we need to know the word. That's why we need to know what God says about us. That's why we need to believe that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that we are accepted in the beloved, that we are seated in heavenly places, that God has loved us. And, and with, an, with, with loving kindness, God has drawn, drawn us and that God does not, uh, that performance is not a part of what makes us lovable that God does not require that we perform. God loves us as he is, like a piece of clothing in Filene's basement. That with all that God knows to, about us, God loves us. And that God has gone to extraordinary length to demonstrate God's love for us. And so when we anchor our sense of validation in God's love and acceptance of us. We are liberated. Somebody type that word, liberated, liberated from the need to be constantly validated. To be constantly validated. And we can resist the pressures of comparison and competition and even conformity. Because we recognize that even if nobody ever calls our name, if nobody ever, be, and we all have a need for that. Don't get me wrong. We're not talking about a basic general need that is, is a part of how we are wired, how God has created us. God has wired all of us to need affirmation and acceptance and attention. We all need some at some, po at some point. But we also also must ground our own self-worth in God's validation so that our internal validation from God shapes our perspective, shapes our worthiness. And instead of measuring our value based on external achievements and uh, accolades, et cetera, we find fulfillment knowing that we're living in according to God's purpose and that God, as, as the Lord said, as God said about, um, about Jesus, when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That God's affirmation is spoken over our lives. That if we never do another thing, that God loves us regardless. Type that in the chat, regardless. That God loves us regardless. And I know that that's not necessarily comforting to some of us because God is invisible. And we live in relationships with people that we interact with every day who some would chew through a rock with no teeth to avoid validating us. But at the end of the day, we must believe that internal validation 
form, provides a firm foundation for our sense of worth and, and, and identity. Okay, I'm going to stop right there uh, because it's almost 7.30. It, uh, well, it is 7.30. Any comments or questions before, before we end? Because I'm not going to start with tendency to blame others because that'll be another 30 minutes. Any comments, questions? Who are y'all quiet? My comment is thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> to God be the glory, thank you. Thank you, Dwan. Thank you. Somebody Mother said Warren. regardless, type regardless in the chat, regardless. Regard and, and somebody type in the chat, Lord, don't let it be me. <laughs> don't let, Lord, don't let it be me. Don't let me be the person that needs extra stroking. It's got to be told every 15 minutes how wonderful I am. That cannot celebrate other people. You know, so often when we think about this, we think about other people. And we can all think about people that are draining and that require that kind of validation. And, and who will actually get upset if you don't validate them. But Lord, don't let it be me. Any, 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 any questions before we before we end? Questions, comments. Mm -hmm. Pastor, Pastor, about. Pastor, I just want to say first <laughs> thank you. Now I only mean, I have a very small congregation, probably about maybe 20, 25 people. And one night we were doing prayer and I was trying to do the tech and I was trying to read the comments all at the same time. And I was trying to call the people's name and say thank you and pray for them individually. Uh -huh. And lo and behold, I got a text message from one of the members that said, you didn't call my name. And I was like, well, good God for mighty. I can't be the tech person, call the names, <laughs> pray for everybody. I can't do it. Just can I get a break? <laughs> but I, what I, <laughs> whoo Jesus, what I found out is that she is one of those people that constantly leaves stroking, that she's one, that she mm -hmm. has to have her name called. It's just every time, no matter what it is. If you're in church and service, she want her name called. After service, she want to be in your face. I just, mm -hmm. Lord have mercy. And so I, I figured that out. But then I had to tell her, listen, I can't just always be attentive to you. It's other people here that I got to say hello to and be attentive to. And she kind of has calmed down a little bit. But when you said that, I just kind of screamed back here because I remember that day like it was yesterday. <laughs> like, how, how can not be the tech person, the pastor, the intercessor? I can't call all them. You ain't giving me no kind of break. You just want all the attention. <laughs> but I, I wrote every note down that you said. Thank you so very much. <laughs> and, and you know, and that kind of goes back to that uh, misinterpretation of intention. And, you know, one of the things that some of the saints have probably heard me say is, and I've said this in passing, and I told them, touch your neighbor, tell them you're not the only one. Because so often in congregations, we act like we're the only one. That we are the only one. And it's one senior pastor. Now, we have staff pastors, thank be to God. But even with the staff pastor, it's still just one pastor. And so you're not the only one. You're not the only one that brings concern. But we often act like we're the only one. And sometimes that misinterp misinterpretation of intention. This is why I think a lot of times, you know, I get in trouble probably a lot of times more than I probably would like to because I'm one of these kind of people that like to affirm. I like to congratulate. I like to celebrate. I like to clap and and you know tell folk to stand because i understand that one first of all one of my spiritual gifts is encouragement i already know that i'm clear that one of my spiritual gifts is exhortation but i also understand that exhortation and encouragement is oxygen for the soul right and so whenever i hear some good news i'm going to tell it but there's going to always inevitably be somebody that thinks, and I'm not saying this to, to direct this at anybody. I'm just saying this because of the way it works. There's always going to be somebody that thinks, well, she just recognized them because she liked them. That's, that's, that's how that 
mindset. It has nothing to do with favoritism. It has nothing. There are people that I like and I appreciate and I celebrate, but I try to be fair and recognize every and celebrate every accomplishment. But the other thing is I can't celebrate what I don't know. Type, type that in the chat. You can't celebrate what you don't know. You can't clap for what you don't know. So you can't be mad because somebody does. And you have to give people grace that sometimes they just forget. Type that in the chat too. Type give folk grace. Give folks grace. Because sometimes it's not that you're being overlooked. It's not that somebody's trying to ignore you. It's not that somebody's trying to mistreat you or that you're not the favorite one. You're not the whatever. It's because folk are human. And we have to give folk grace, which is really what we're going to end up getting to at the core of um of this lesson when we get through going over some of the reasons why we get offended. And again, I see these reasons more, it, it, it works two ways, but I think if we don't look at it as a self-assessment tool and we only look at it as a way of seeing why other folk get offended and not think about which of these do I do? Which of these apply to me? Then we miss the point of the lesson. Why? Because at the end of the day, we all get offended by something or we are all hurt by something. Any other any other comments before we get off the call? Cause y'all can tell I'm getting fired up. I always get fired up when it's time to go. Any other any other comments or questions before yeah, we go? Is this helping y'all? Is this helping y'all? Yes, yes, okay, yes. okay, 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 okay. So I was, gonna, I was gonna say this pastor, number one. Daddy. I have really, can you give me a minute Trinity? <laughs> I have really gotten accustomed <laughs> to uh, getting off Bible study at eight o'clock, so my spirit is still hungry. Uh, <laughs> the second thing is spiritual maturity, and you you touched on it early, earlier. A lot of this, as we grow in Christ, mm -hmm. will relieve itself. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. in our twenties, you wanna you want people to, but when you get to be fifty, you shouldn't still need the same encouragement and pat on the back and nod on the head that you had when you was 25, right? So as we grow, and that's so important as we grow in Christ, that we realize that now it's time for the new babies to get the attention. Mm -hmm. You should, you, you know, we're talking about being rooted. Mm -hmm. We should be rooted in Christ enough after 20 years on this journey to not need so much attention. So now pastor can give her attention to the new babies that need to be rooted. And you know, that's just that's they just something attention. that yeah, they need attention, Trinity, like you do right now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Pat, you, you know what I'm saying? So I just wanted to make that comment. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 to follow up with what Tracy just said, if you remember about three years ago, one of the things, not three years ago, three, four weeks ago, when I was talking about how all of us have emotions that are touched. Uh, or maybe injured uh, because of something that's either done to us or because of a choice that we make to be offended. But none of that should contribute to us embarrassing God. And I mentioned that until our emotions are transformed, we will not experience spiritual maturity. And I would argue that this is the area of most believers life that is the most untransformed area, if you will, because it's too much work. It's work. It's painful to get better. It's painful to, 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 to look at ourselves and self interrogate and ask ourselves, why does it anger me? Why did that make me mad? Why did I get offended? That is work because it means we have to do some internal reflection and some self critique. And it's easier to project out than it is to take ownership and responsibility for those kinds of things that cause us to uh, fall short, if you will, of representing Jesus. But as you said, it all lead, it all points us toward spiritual maturity, growing up into the head. 
so that the pastor is not the only one doing everything or a core group of people are not the only ones doing everything. In the book of Hebrews, Paul says this, or the writer of Hebrews, you know, they say that really the writer of Hebrews was a woman named Priscilla, but that's a whole nother Bible study for another day. Um, uh, at the end of the day, the writer of Hebrews said, by now you ought to be leading other people. He's talking to that faith community. He's talking to them about, by now you ought to be on milk and not on meat. Spiritual maturity. Because at the end of the day, what is required for spiritual maturity requires a much larger investment than just being saved and just salvation. It requires my investment and I must be willing to do the hard work of doing some internal work and some self-interrogation so that I can become a better person in Christ Jesus. So you're right, Tracy. It does it, it in the final analysis, it it all boils down to spiritual maturity. Anybody else? I was just sitting here thinking that usually every week you'll say, "Did you go and talk to anybody about the Bible study last week?" And the difference with this Bible study for me is that I have to show it and not just say it. And so other people are seeing the difference mm. not just hearing it so i really Praise appreciate it. and so do the people around me right now that is a so wonderful i'm testimony. going through some things and i would have been a whole different person a couple of weeks ago if you hadn't been doing this bible study wow <laughs> praise god well, thank you hallelujah glory to god that's worth the price of admission right there that is worth the price of admission. Thank you for sharing that, Tracy. Thank you. Anybody else before we leave, before we shut it down for the night? <laughs> My mom wanted to say something. I think, okay. I think you guys know each other. Hello, Dr. Stewart. This is hey. Dr. Dr. McCabe. I, I I don't know if you can see me or not. No. Oh, I can't. Good. I'm glad you can't. Because <laughs> <laughs> where I've been bid. Uh, do you remember me? What's your first name? Dolores. Oh yeah. Uh from from Yeah, from La Carrie. La Carrie, that's right. Uh -huh. And you know what? I'm I'm here for April um April the the um spring conference now I'm in New Jersey oh okay it's good to hear your voice good to hear yours I'm, I was just gonna um say that it's good to always remember early childhood woundedness mm -hmm. and that sometimes when people respond to us in certain ways they it, 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 they were something was triggered inside and it reminded them of that old wound and 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 I don't know how you deal with that in terms of Christian circles but uh I mean usually a person who has wounds that deep needs to go and talk to somebody mm -hmm. but uh but that's it's I think he helps to remember that that uh, sometimes people have woundedness that happened way before we knew them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we just happen to say something or do something and it, and it triggers that. Mm -hmm. So their reaction sometimes is because of the past uh, woundedness rather than the current event. Even Even though it seems like it's a current event. It really is that they had such deep wounds, mm -hmm. such painful wounds from the past. Right. You know, and I, like a father or a mother telling you all the time, you're stupid. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, somebody telling you all the time that you're never going to be anything. That type of thing. 
And I think, I think that that's why black folk in particular must embrace counseling. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's not just some of us, it's all of us. Mm -hmm. All of us have wounds and we, we, I think we talked about this a few weeks ago too. And I talked about why, you know, having someone like Dr. Carter on staff and others at our church with backgrounds in mental health is such a blessing. Yeah. But until we destigmatize counseling um, in our tradition and, and, and until we recognize that counseling and faith can coexist because, you know, we have this, this, absolutely this idea that somehow if you go to counseling, you don't have faith or mm -hmm. if you go to counseling, you're crazy. Uh, but it, it really is a gift uh, to the body of Christ mm -hmm. because we all have wounds. I think I've, I've said this to you all before, and I don't know how long ago it was, but I remember one time I was having a conversation with myself about um, control, you know, and I, as an adult, particularly it, when in my first, in my initial years of pastoring, you know, I was always, I was, all, I found myself resisting when I felt like somebody was controlling me. And finally, I had to ask myself, why did I feel like that? Why was that such a strong inclination? And it took me back to my childhood of being bullied. Mm. Most of my elementary years, I was bullied because oh. I was, um, it's hard to believe it now. I'm still an introvert by nature. I'm a functional extrovert, but by nature, I'm an introvert. And in most of my years of elementary school, I was bullied. And when I finally developed a, uh, a, a type of resistance to that, I went from one extreme to the other. It took me going through my pastoral uh, care practicum and even doing some self-interrogation as a pastor to say, mm -hmm. this is where this is coming from. Right. It's not just me. It's not just some people. Everybody on this call, all of us, have been wounded by something. If it wasn't something in our family of origin, it was because of some kind of relationships that we experienced growing up. For me, it was peers that mm -hmm. created some of the wounds that I experienced. Uh, not to say that I didn't have some wounds from family of origin, but my point is we all could stand to have a counselor <laughs> or, or a therapist. You know, somebody that we could talk to, this is the gift of having a an associate pastor of counseling that the church employs to make this service available. We don't charge, we take donations, but you can make an appointment with Dr. Carter any day of the week, pretty much if her schedule permits. This is why we host this emotionally healthy spirituality that, we, that I keep talking about and doing these... Uh, commercials and we're going to start offering a class at an alternate time beyond Sunday morning because all of us have some wounds. All of us do. And the wounds are not permanently healed because life wounds us. So even after childhood, we're wounded. In adolescence, we're wounded. In, a, in, in adulthood, we're wounded. So ongoing accountability through counseling is so essential for us to be not just healthy, but also whole and spiritually mature. Reverend Vahisha said that uh, Dr. Carter is talking, saying some good stuff in the Sunday school class, you know, and, 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 but, but until we destigmatize it in our own minds, because I can say it over and over and over again, but if in your mind, you still think that you don't, need counseling because there are some folks that think they don't need it and then and then there are other people that just don't want it but at the end of the day as you said dr mccabe because of the wounds that we have accumulated and we will continue to accumulate as long as we decide to be in relationship with other people and not exist as a hermit or live in isolation we are going to be wounded alicia you have your hand up
Alicia. Yes, I, yes, I did. I'm sorry it took me so long. I'm trying to, you know, navigate okay. all of this. <laughs> <laughs> but um, good evening, everybody. I hadn't had my picture on. I was trying to uh, multitask based on the time I have. I was trying to clean my room, be on Bible study, and respond. And, but I really felt impressed to share something. Hopefully, this will help somebody. Um, and I'm trying to share it in a way that that um, uh, the people that are involved remain innocent, you know, or whatever anonymous. they say, you know, anonymous, right? But I have a family member who, you know, sometimes I don't care what you do, some people will never find any good in what you do. Mm -hmm. And I was beginning to wonder. You know, why is it that this person is always so unappreciative? I don't care what you do. They're never happy. It's never enough. Mm -hmm. But they always find a way to call you back and ask for something else. And I didn't know how to tell the person no. Because um, they were always, it would always just pull at my heartstrings when they said that they needed something. I will admit that part of what pulled at my heartstrings was uh, something my mother told me the day she passed away. And mm -hmm. that was to, you know, look out for them, help them, don't be so hard on, you know, that kind of thing. And it was looming over me. And I just didn't have, um, I just, I couldn't figure out when they were lying and when they was telling the truth, when they really needed something and when they didn't. And I would always find myself, whenever they called crying, showing up on the doorstep with what they needed. But this one particular day, uh, when they called saying they was hungry, they needed something, that they didn't have anything, I, I sent them a text and said, I'll bring you something when I got off. And I went to Sonic and I picked them up something to eat. And when I got to them, they said, did you see my text? I said, no, I didn't. I was driving. And I looked down at the text and just felt fire coming up the back of my back all the way up to my neck <laughs> because it was a long grocery list by two of these and three of these and this, that, and the other. And I looked at the text and I looked back at them and I said, you know what? I have this Sonic food for you. And you might want to make this last. You can cut this hamburger in half. And you can, because I, I can't stop and go to the grocery store tomorrow. And I can't stop. And then I finally said, you know what? If I told you I was dating a person that treated you, treated me the way you treat me, you tell me to leave them. Mm -hmm. The only <laughs> problem is I can't leave you. I can't mm -hmm. quit you. Mm hmm and I, that was the first time I said, just stop it. You know, just stop using me. Just stop treating me like, you know, I, I, you, you beg me for what you need and then, but you do what you want. And it was, that was the day I really felt liberation from that situation of even what my mother told me on her deathbed. Let me tell y'all something about these deathbed requests. They will run you down in the ground. You still have to use discernment when you're dealing with people, especially family members. I'm not perfect. I have things that I've needed. Um, and, and, you know, I have people that I can call if I need something, but I try not to bother people. I try not to ask anybody for anything. I don't view it as being strong. I just kind of view it as not being a burden and managing my resources, mm -hmm. you know, but. I had to stop it. I told them I only hear from you when you don't need anything. I've been sick for, th you know, I could be sick for three or four days. You wouldn't know because you only call when you need something. You just don't call when you, you don't call to check on. So I think sometimes we have to have very honest conversations with people to let them know how what they're doing is affecting us. You know, what you're doing to me is affecting me mentally. It, it breaks me down. It sends me home crying. It, it keeps me up at night. I, I was just honest. I just laid it all on the line. And it was amazing to me how uh, apologetic they became and told me they were sorry. And I was like, you know, I live in a judge-free zone. I know people have habits. I know they, 
they do what they like to do. Some people like to go to the casino. Some people like to go to happy hours. Some people, I don't care what your recreation is, your outlet is. But what I'm asking is that you not spend your grocery money on your outlet. <laughs> because you don't know the sacrifice I have to make to give you what you need after you've already done what you wanted to do. And mm. so hopefully, you know, that helped somebody. I felt bad afterwards. I cried all the way home. But I still felt a little freedom from having the conversation because I'd never had it. I would just go with a bad attitude. I'd buy what they needed with a bad attitude. I'd take it to them with a bad attitude. And then I'd be mad why they eat for the next two, three weeks off of what I bought with a happy attitude. And I'm still mad. <laughs> so I just had, I got tired. I just got, I was exhausted. And I was like, I got to free myself from this. And, and it, and, and I think it was a breakthrough for both of us. I, mm. I do. I really do. But we'll see. I'm not going to completely, I'm not going to move forward with caution because I don't want to put up a barrier. But I'm going to continue to pray that God break down the barriers mm -hmm. so that we can operate in honesty and, and not, you know, um, just do surface stuff. I'm, and I'm talking about me and the family member that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But that's all. I hope that helps somebody. Well, yeah, based on the based on the comments in the in the chat. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> oh, I couldn't see the chat. I was trying to concentrate. You you help somebody <laughs> because we mm -hmm. all know about those relationships where uh people don't respect boundaries, you know, yeah. refuse to respect boundaries. And we also have are in relationship with people who don't want responsibility. But, you right. know, I always say the first thing God gave them in the garden was responsibility. He gave them a job. First thing God gave Adam and Eve in Genesis was a job. He said, till, keep, tend, tend, tend to the garden, dress it, keep it up. Responsibility is something that everybody has. But it was when my, my sister asked me that question. Why, why did you go? Why, why do you, why, why did you, and, and I couldn't answer. I could, I could not give her, I said, well, I, I don't think, know. I think you answered it because you said you, you made a deathbed vow, promise, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But you know, that other, I think the other thing that makes those deathbed promises or any other promises um, open for negotiation is that that promise can only be validated when that person is operating from a healthy place. That's true. <laughs> when, when the person that, 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 that promise was made for is not necessarily operating from a healthy place or, or in a space of dysfunction, it becomes challenging for you to honor the promise that you made. And so right. you probably want to start saying to the best of my ability. Uh, right. <laughs> Oh, as God, well, what I said was, uh, oh, as God mother, helps me, or as I'm, able, can't do it no more. <laughs> as I'm able, <laughs> right, right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there are a number of people in the, in the, um, in the chat, because we all know people that don't want to, don't want to be responsible. We all yeah. know people that go through life with a victim mentality that are looking for some, for somebody else to blame and somebody else to hold responsible for 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 their well-being but we all grow and I, and I think the thing that kept looming in the back of my head it was related to food a person being hungry and knowing that my sister and I live together we have a refrigerator and two freezers i mean we could feed like <laughs> the street and then I was thinking, what kind of person would I be knowing all the food I got at home? And I won't even do this for this person. And, you know, yeah. yeah, I can't do it no more. I can't do it no more. I, I just, I cannot. So, I mean, I'm not saying I, I won't help the person, but what I'm saying is you you have to find a, a place of being rational in your own mind when, when people come calling about things. Mm -hmm. But that's all. Thank you, Pastor. Mm -mm, thank you. All right. We ready to, we ready to sign off. Y'all been hanging, hanging pretty tough, but it's eight o'clock. 
Well, we ain't ready, but we gonna go because you. Yeah, I I, I you, actually have your another, ministry is to the world. To the I world. actually have another meeting after this with the executive secretary, so I need to go. Yeah. But thank you all for for hanging on and and for your participation and for the conversation and and for sharing and uh, as somebody said uh, for your vulnerability, Alicia and for the praise reports and all of that. And just for showing up every week, God bless you. Keep praying for Pastor Chuck and um, and uh, Dr. Deneen and Alice and, um, and family um, and continue to pray for all of our members that are uh, sick and shut in that are going through uh, sickness and, and also those that are still grieving the loss of family members. Some of you may remember Rebecca Green who attended our church for many years and then she became ill. Rebecca passed one day last week. I just found out um, yesterday that she passed because her daughter asked me to do the eulogy. Her eulogy is going to be on April the 30th at Serenity um, Funeral Home. Some of you, particularly if you were in building A, because by the time we moved into building B, um, I think she has started having some health challenges, but I just want to mention that Pastor Dunnigan, if you're still on here, I'll get with you so you can reach out to them. But the service is going to be April 30th at, um, I think it's at 11 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. You got the number today. Good. All right. Praise God. So any, any other prayer requests before we uh, jump off the line, just type them in the chat right quick before we go. And I'm going to ask, uh, is Dr. Is Dr. Card on Reverend Vahisha, why don't you close us in prayer? I'm here, Pastor. Okay. Dr. Stewart, is it, is it, um, I'm doing some grandma care. Is it okay if Dr. Carter does? Because otherwise my, gra my grandma's going to join in the chorus, whether you want that or not. <laughs> oh, okay. I've, absolutely. So are you still with your grandmother? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. So we, and we pray for her too. She's waving right now. So wave grandma. Hey, grandmother. Hey, grandma. Hey, Grandma. Hello. How you doing? Grandma is 91. <laughs> Praise God. So Amen. please, please who, whoever's praying, include her in the prayer, but I'm going to stay on mute. I'm so sorry, Dr. Stewart. No, no problem. No problem. Okay, Doc. Doc? Yes, ma'am. Are you are you able to pray? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ready? Uh-huh. Okay. Dear God, gracious God, merciful God, we come before you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We give you praise and we honor you and we bless you. And we thank you for all the ways that you have blessed us this day. We thank you for uh, your protection over us. We thank you for your provisions and we thank you for this time that you have allowed us to spend learning and growing and helping us to apply what we have learned so that we can be mature Christians, a mature church. We thank you for our pastor and we pray that you continue to bless her, crown her head with wisdom, give her strength in her body, Father God, her mind and her soul and her spirit, God. Uh, and just help her to do all the things that are assigned to her. Yes, Heavenly Lord. Father, we thank you for every person on this call. We pray that you meet every need. You know every heart. You know every person. You know every situation. So God, we trust you and we commend these things to you because your word declares that there is nothing too hard for you. You are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask, think, or imagine. So God, burn this word in our hearts, burn the scriptures in our hearts and help us to seek to apply them to our lives. Father God, so that we can function in the world as you desire us to. Father God, we ask your blessings as we go through this night. Keep us, protect us, God. 
and just have your way in our lives. Father God, we thank you for all that you have done and what we believe that you are going to do. Bless those who are sick. Bless those who are bereaved. Uh, give comfort, Father God, where it's needed. The ministry of presence, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And in all things, we will endeavor to give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, thank you. Have a great night tonight. See you all Sunday. Good night, Pastor. Be safe. Bye. Good night. Good night. Thank Good night. you, Pastor Stewart. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Night. Thank you. Travel safely, Pastor. All right. Thank you.